Okay, I think we can get started now. Hi, everybody. I'm Rich Luer. I'm the publisher of Airstream Life magazine and the founder of the Airstream Life store, where I'm standing right now in our new retail store here in Tucson, Arizona, which uh, we just opened a few months ago. I'm very excited to do this seminar for you. We're expecting hundreds of people. They're still logging in right now. Uh, we're going to have a lot of ground to cover, even though I'm trying to keep this very focused. Uh, and we invite your questions, but just wanted to warn you that we've only got about 45 minutes for presentation and about 15 minutes for questions. We'll do Q&A during those last 15 minutes. So please put your questions in the Q&A. There's a window at the bottom of your screen. And just keep in mind that because there's so many people here, we're not gonna get to every question. So try to limit your questions to just one or two. And understand that if we don't get to you into the seminar, uh, webinar, it's not because we didn't like you or we didn't like your questions, just because there's too many to get to. I'm joined by our product expert, Tony Wellner and Tothi, who are both uh, helping out with the Q&A. So they'll be responding to some of your comments in real time on Q&A window. And they'll bring me some of the questions uh, that they'd like me to answer on video. As a reminder, we're recording today's webinar. We can't see you, we cannot hear you, um, but we'll be posting this webinar to YouTube in the next few days. So if you wanna watch it again or share it with somebody you know, uh, we'll send you the link uh, shortly after we complete this webinar. Uh, now, if you wanna change anything about how you're seeing this, uh, look for the view button at the top of your Zoom screen. Uh, you have the ability to change the settings on how things are displayed, whether you wanna see uh, me bigger or the slide bigger or whatever like that. That's up to you. Okay, so let's get started. What I wanna talk about is basic maintenance. And I'm assuming a lot of people who are coming to the seminar are fairly new to Airstreaming. You might have some experience and still have some questions, but a lot of people are probably fairly new. And so I want to uh, make it clear that basic maintenance is something that everyone can do. It's really not that difficult and you don't need a lot of tools. The picture that you see here is my maintenance book, the Airstream Life Nearly Complete Guide to Airstream Maintenance, uh, which covers many of the topics that we're going to talk, actually it covers all the topics we're going to talk about today, plus a lot more. And so I regard this book as the companion guide for the presentation that I'm giving you today. So if you want more detail on any particular subject, I do recommend getting a copy of the book. It's $27.95 and you can buy it in our online store and on Amazon. One of the key things about this though is that most of the processes that I'm going to talk about, the procedures for maintenance and the little repairs and simple things like that that you can do require very little in terms of tools and almost no actual skill. So if you're intimidated by tools and things and terminology, don't worry about it. We're going to try to keep it very, very simple and cover some of the basic maintenance things that affect the major systems of the Airstream. And when I'm talking about major systems, I'm talking about the propane system, the electrical system, and the freshwater plumbing system, not sewage at this point. So those are the three basic systems we're gonna talk about. We're also gonna do a little bit of conversation about tires because it's always a popular topic. Let's start with the propane system. Your propane system in an Airstream has these basic components. You've got two tanks up front that hold the propane. Everybody knows about those. You've got some hoses and you can see the black hoses in the picture that attach to the tank. You've got a regulator. And that is the thing in the middle with the, uh, with the knob on it that goes green and red that tells you how much, whether you're out of propane on a particular tank, the changeover regulator. And finally, you've got the appliances, anything that runs on gas, your furnace, stove, refrigerator, water heater, uh, all these things run on gas. So those are all part of the propane system. One of the basic maintenance things that anyone can do is to take a look at those hoses that I was talking about. They connect directly to the tank with that big green fitting that you can see in the picture. These hoses do not last forever. The hoses are um, affected particularly when they're exposed to the sun, but in most airstreams they're under cover, so they last a little bit longer. But even when they're not exposed to the sun, the hoses will eventually age out. And one of the key things to look for is cracking or excessive stiffness in the hose. When a hose looks like the one in this picture, it's way past its expiration date. It is, it is ready to be replaced. Now, just because there's cracks in it like that doesn't mean the hose will leak because there's actually an inner and an outer lining to a hose. The outer lining that's cracking is more protective and cosmetic. The inner lining is one that actually contains the propane. But if the outer lining is starting to crack, it's a pretty good sign that that hose has gone past its expiration date. And, you know, people always ask me, how long should I expect the hose to last? I can't give you a hard number on that. 
Uh, it's best to keep an eye on your hoses. If they turn like they're absolutely stiff and you can barely bend them anymore, that's a good sign. If they're cracking, that's a good sign that they're, that they're ready to be replaced. Uh, it can be anywhere from one or two years to five years um, between you know, when they start to uh, get to the point where they need replacement. Another basic piece of maintenance is checking for gas leaks. The gas freaks people out because they think it's gonna, gonna go boom. And the reality is, is that your Airstream, like all RVs, like your house, has a lot of safety devices built into it to make the, uh, the, the gas system extremely redundantly safe. However, it's still a good idea to check for leaks. And the key point place that you're going to look for leaks is at the ends of the hoses. If you see both of those pictures, the black hose goes to a chrome colored um, attachment. And then there's a piece of brass beyond that that's threading into something. It's at these connection points where hoses tend to leak the most. That's where they fail. Or if they haven't been properly connected, they're going to fail. Um, in one of these pictures, and, and you can barely see it, um, but in the picture on the right, um, this was submitted by a customer and they had made a mistake. They had used Teflon tape, which is the yellow stuff you can see on both sides of that brass fitting. And in fact, they were only supposed to use it on one side. So when they sprayed it with soapy water, they found a leak. The Teflon tape was actually causing a leak because they were using it inappropriately. Whenever we sell somebody a, a replacement propane hose or a gas stop kit or anything that connects to the propane, we always make sure that they get the Teflon tape, but more importantly, they get instructions and a little bottle, and I'll break one out here actually, a little bottle for testing for gas leaks. You can use almost anything, even a, even a sponge will do, but I'm talking about something like this, just a little spritzer bottle and you put some water in it, and a few drops of uh, dish soap, and it will give it a good shake, mix it up, and then spray that on the connections. And you're going to see something like what you see in the pictures here, uh, bubbles forming. Now the bubbles, if they sit there and then they slowly pop, you don't have a leak. But if you see big bubbles forming and popping over and over again, that's gas leaking out. So the soapy bubble test is really easy. Anyone can do it, and you can do it as many times as you want. So. Uh, much better than relying on your nose. I've had customers come and say, I think I have a gas leak is every time I open the lid by my propane tanks, I'm smelling gas and they're freaked out. That doesn't mean there's a leak. Sometimes you get sort of a stain of the gas odor in that area. And so it smells like a leak, but it's not a leak. The only way to be sure is with the soapy water test. Check carefully, look on all sides and you'll get a good idea of whether or not there's actually a leak happening. Some other propane inspection things that anyone can do. The propane tanks themselves are supposed to be checked for rust, damage, and expiration date. Believe it or not, these tanks don't last forever. After uh, about, I think it's 12 years, the tank is supposed to be uh, inspected by a professional. So every time you buy propane, the propane guy, the filler guy, is going to take a look at that tank. And he's supposed to check for things that, like those things I mentioned, and also proper labeling and some other things. If he sees damage, he's supposed to report it to you and not fill the tank. So you get a free propane tank inspection every time you uh, get propane filled. But it doesn't hurt for you to take a look at it yourself. If it's starting to look really scabby, it might be a good idea to get a new tank or at least have it professionally checked out. The other check that you can do is for slow leaks. The soapy bottle, uh, water bottle test, that one is great for checking for leaks at connection points where things are attached to other things. But it's possible that there's a slow leak somewhere in the system where you're not gonna be able to test it with soapy water very easily. And there's lots of ways to do that. We have a procedure for that. Matter of fact, we have a separate video. And that's why this point is in blue with the underline. It's to remind me to tell you that there's videos on our website lots of videos and on our YouTube channel, Airstream Life, uh, that show you many of the procedures we're talking about. So if you wanna know how to do a slow gas leak check, you can find the video on our website, in our store at store.airstreamlife.com. Go to the video section and the, uh, the how-to videos and you'll see that there. A slow leak check is something that I like to do at least every season. Uh, um, I mean, every camping season, which means you know once or twice a year for me. Uh, I don't, um, I don't do it you know, regularly because it's really not a major thing, but a slow leak may develop over a period of time. And I like to know if there's something going on in the system. So that's what that's all about. Another element 
that is actually technically not part of the propane system, but worth your attention is the propane leak detector. Every Airstream has one. Usually it's a black box like this, sometimes it's white, uh, located down low on a piece of cabinetry, maybe below the refrigerator or next to the furnace or at the base of the dinette. It can be in any number of places, but it's always mounted down low by the floor. The propane leak detector is always on. It's connected directly to the battery. So even when you flip the battery disconnect switch on your Airstream, this thing keeps getting power. And the reason is it's a safety device. It's designed to check if there's, it's sniffing all the time to check and see if there's any gas in getting into the air. Um, it doesn't need any maintenance, except that after seven years, like a smoke detector, it is intended to be replaced. It doesn't last forever. In recent years, you'll notice that at the top of the, uh, in that picture there, you'll notice that Airstream has put a sticker on there and they have written the date that it was installed and the date it needs to be replaced by. One thing to note, that expiration date isn't seven years from when you bought the Airstream. It's seven years from when it was installed, which could be a year or even more before you purchased the Airstream. So go by the date that it was installed. If you ignore it, after about seven years, the newer ones are designed to put out an audible alarm. And after a period of time, that alarm can't be turned off. So you're kind of forced to replace it if you forget about it. That's a good safety thing. Propane system's pretty straightforward. I mean, we just went through all the major components. There's tanks, hoses, regulator doesn't require any maintenance. The appliances are a much, much bigger topic than we can get into in this particular thing. So your basic checks are really very simple. I think we have a question. Can you specify where the Teflon tape actually goes? Okay, a number of people have asked about the Teflon tape that I mentioned. Um, it's I'm going to summarize this for you, but if you buy any of our kits, we do have pictures and a very clear explanation of where you should use Teflon tape. But the rule of thumb is that the Teflon tape only goes on a threaded fitting. It does not go on what's called a compression fitting. I don't have one here that I can show you that's big enough to show on the screen. Um, but if it's a compression type fitting, it does not use Teflon tape. That was the mistake that our customer made. He put Teflon tape on a compression fitting and the Teflon tape just got in the way and created a leak where there shouldn't have been one. Threaded fittings just have threads. And if that doesn't make sense to you, uh, you need to look at one of the guides or maybe Google compression fittings versus threaded fittings and gas systems and you'll see pictures of what we're talking about. But you don't use Teflon tape on the compression fittings. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to the water system if there's no other, okay. The water system is similarly simple. Now we've obviously got the city water inlet that everybody knows. What not everybody knows is that this water inlet on all modern airstreams includes a pressure regulator, which means you don't need a separate pressure regulator on your hose. Uh, well, if you have a good hose, a lot of times you get to a campground and they'll have very high water pressure and they'll have a sign warning, we have high water pressure, don't. You know, you better use a regulator or something bad's gonna happen. A lot of RV brands don't actually put pressure regulators into the plumbing system. It's amazing to me, but it's not an expensive thing, but they don't do it. Airstream always does. This water fill that you see in the picture is a SureFlow one. It's used on many Airstreams. It's been used for many years. It includes a regulator. So you do not need a separate regulator. If you put a regulator at the uh, campground fitting before the hose, it's only to protect the hose itself. And if you have a cheap white vinyl hose, the kind of the disposable kind that we all buy for the first time, you might need that because those hoses can't take high water pressure. But shameless plug here, if you buy a good water hose like our Ultimate RV water hose, this one can take over 300 PSI. It does not require a regulator. It will not be damaged and we guarantee that for five years. So get a good water hose, you won't need a separate water pressure regulator. Talk for that. On the water pump, a lot of people don't realize that there is this strainer that you see in the picture. It's a sediment filter. It's a very coarse filter. It's not a water taste filter, not like a charcoal filter. It's more of a screen. And uh, it is basically designed to keep chunks of sediment from getting through and clogging the pump, damaging it. It rarely needs to be serviced, but if it does, it's buried deep in a closet somewhere where it's quite hard to get to. And rather than go through the exercise of having to clean out that sediment filter, but I strongly recommend is that you always use a charcoal water filter or better at the uh, city water connection or the connection to the Airstream. In other words, you wanna filter all the water that's going into your Airstream with a good filter. 
That will take out any sediment. You won't have to worry about this sediment filter getting clogged someday, which is gonna save you a lot of trouble because it's no fun trying to get in to get to one of these things and get it out so you can clean it. But if you ever do have the problem, it is removable, it can be cleaned and it can be put back in. One of the big pieces of maintenance, the biggest for the water filter, water system that I see is almost universally neglected is sanitizing the freshwater tank and the piping. It's people, I don't know, nobody wants to do it. I, I don't really know what the issue is. It's not that hard. I think it's just more of a matter of, we don't really understand how simple it is. The instructions are on this page. They're also in my maintenance book. And if you don't have that, they're also in, I'm gonna grab this, the newbie's guide to airstreaming. Hmm? Oh, and we just did a blog on it too. So there's so many places you can get the instructions on how to uh, sanitize your freshwater system. Not complicated. I actually recommend reading the blog because that's where we did the best job. We just put a blog out a couple of weeks ago about that. Again, it's on the blog page of the Airstream Life store. Uh, we have lots of how-to blogs. Very, very simple procedure. You basically mix some bleach and some water. You dump it in the tank. You fill the tank with fresh water. Run all the faucets until you smell bleach at all of them, hot and cold. Let it sit for a few hours, drain it out. It's not terribly complicated. You don't need to take it to the service center to have this simple procedure done. And you should do it at least once a year, if not more. If you think, well, I don't need to sanitize it because we don't drink from the tank, that's not the real point. You may not drink the water from the tank. And frankly, we don't usually drink it either. We usually bring drinking water along with us. But we do brush our teeth. We do make spaghetti from water that comes from the tank. Uh, it goes in the dog's bowl. So there's a lot of reasons why you want that system to be sanitized. And in addition to all that, if you don't sanitize it periodically, eventually something nasty is gonna grow inside the tank. It might be algae, uh, you know, if, I don't even wanna think about it, but before you get, you know, seaweed, you know, kelp forest growing inside your tank, uh, periodically treating it with this bleach and water solution and following the instructions will solve you just a host, host of problems. And uh, you'll feel better about the water that you're giving to your dog. So. Water heaters have gotten a lot better in the past few years. If you have a 2021 or later model year Airstream, you probably have this Girard tankless water heater installed. It's a wonderful thing because it doesn't require any significant maintenance by the user. There is a door on the outside of your Airstream uh, that you can uh, open up to take a look at the backside of this thing. And basically your maintenance comes down to keeping it clean. Make sure there's no leaves in there, no spider webs, no wasp nests, things like that going on there that are gonna gunk up the works. Spiders really like, for some reason, they tend to be attracted to areas where there's propane gas and they like to set up houses in the flues and things like that. And uh, it's such a simple problem to solve. The bigger problem is probably wasps. They rarely do this, but if the wasps get in there, it's gonna cause you a host of problems too. So your only maintenance for the Girard tankless water heater is basically to take a look at once in a while at the outside of it and make sure nothing looks wrong. You can also look for a blue flame. So there's a little site area, a little site where you can see the blue flame uh, when it's running. And if the flame is not blue, if it's yellow or something like that, uh, it might need adjustment of service by a propane that technician. But otherwise, um, that's pretty much it for the tankless water heater. Uh, there is a special, um, I wouldn't say special winterization procedure for the tanks. And winterization gets way beyond the topic that I want to get into because we can talk about winterization for a whole other seminar. Um, Airstream orders these tankless water heaters with an option that um, uh, allows them to operate in uh, colder temperatures without freezing up. But um, as far as winterizing goes, no, you don't actually have to do anything special because there's so little water in it. It is in fact tankless. The small amount of water that is in the tube um, from what I've read and uh, heard from many sources does not read anything in particular to get it out of there. It's not enough to do damage. So that's good news there. Does this, the question is, does the city water run through the water tank? And the answer is no, it does not. When you're connected to city water, uh, the tank is bypassed. There's a valve for that. It's automatic. And so when you are um, running city water, you are drinking city water, except for what was already in the pipe. You know, you might want to flush that out. But otherwise, no. Um, the city water is not supposed to connect to the water tank. 
Uh, the only time that can happen is if that little check valve fails. And if that happens and you hook up to city water, it can gradually fill up the water tank and then overflow. So if you come back to your stream and water is pouring out of the city water fill and you can't figure out why, it's because that check valve failed. It's not a common thing to have happen, but it does happen once in a while. Good questions. Now, if you have an older Airstream prior to 2021, you probably have an Atwood or Dometic water heater. Uh, it's the same thing, whether whichever brand it is. This one has the same inspection as far as bugs and leaves and things like that. And you can see the flame very easily on this one when it's running. It might flicker yellow a little bit once in a while, or it might make a little bit of a screeching noise for a few seconds. But for the most part, it should just run blue and that's perfectly normal. There is a valve at the top of the water heater, the thing with the little red plastic and the blue label on it. Uh, that is called a PT valve or pressure temperature valve. And it's basically an overflow protection device for it to be accurate and overheat. Uh, protection device. If the tank gets too hot or too much pressure in it, rather than blowing up, that thing will release the pressure. It's just a safety device. Once in a while, it will drip. If it drips and you are, um, the first thing you want to do is go inside and run the hot water for just a few seconds. If that stops it, you didn't have a problem. But if it keeps dripping, no matter what you do, that valve may, may need to be replaced. It's not a common problem. You might easily go 10 years or more before that thing causes you a problem. It may never cause you a problem, uh, but that's what that is. And then down at the bottom, there is a white plug. Uh, it's way down at the bottom left, right behind that uh, copper and brass looking section. That is the nylon drain plug. Um, the part of your winterizing procedure should be to remove that plug and drain the tank and perhaps flush it out. There's a tool that you can get that actually helps spray out the inside of the tank, but at least drain it and then bypass the tank as part of your winterization procedure. And again, winterization is a whole nother topic. I'm not gonna get into how to bypass the tank, but those instructions are in your Airstream's owner manual. And they are also, I believe online, the Airstream website. Um, but the reason I bring up the nylon drain plug is because a lot of people uh, don't know how to remove it. And they make they actually make two mistakes. One is they don't remove it with the right tool, and two is they reuse it. Both are big mistakes. If you're doing it like on the left there, where you're trying to get in there with your crescent wrench and reach that thing, you're going to have an exercise in frustration. You're going to scrape your knuckles because there's lots of sharp metal in there. You're going to tear up the head of that thing, and it's going to be just hell getting it in and out. What you need is the set of tools on the right side, which is a socket with a uh, socket wrench and an extension. Uh, it takes a 15 16 socket. And with those sets of tools, it's very, very easy to remove that plug and put another one back in. Always use a new plug. Never reuse this plastic plug. It is made of soft nylon. It's not intended to be reused. If you reuse it, it may break the next time you try to take it out or it may leak. Uh, so it is a one-time use plug, which is why we include one of those plugs in our maintenance essentials kits. It's one of those things that you need to have around if you ever are going to drain that tank. Finally, you may have a water filter built into your Airstream. There's, most Airstreams don't have a water filter, but some do as this particular one had one built into, that was my 2005 Safari, and it had a water filter built into the kitchen faucet. If you do, uh, keep in mind that that does need to be replaced periodically. It's easy to forget about it. I recommend getting a couple of spares for whatever water filter you have, maybe it's under the sink or if it's in the faucet and just always having them in the Airstream so that if you forget and you're on a trip, you can always just replace it. It only takes a few minutes to do, it's not a hard job. Um, ditto for your exterior water filters. If you've got one on, uh, that you use on the hose, those are really not intended to be removed more than three or four months and then they should be replaced. They're not expensive, they just screw on. So uh, rather than trying to hold onto that blue water filter for two years, uh, buy a three pack, and just have a couple on hand so you can replace it whenever you need to. Plumbing drains. There is no actual regular maintenance here, but I point this out because this is a common area that causes trouble for people. You see on this drain, there is a white plastic ring and then there's also a black plastic ring just to its left. Those rings are intended to be hand tightened. They're just plastic rings that seal up the pieces of plumbing. You can loosen and tighten them with your hand very easily. Quite often on a bumpy road trip or after the passage of some time, these get loose. So if you open up your cabinets and take a look under the kitchen sink or under the bathroom sink and there's water on the floor, don't panic. The most likely cause is that one of these rings got loose and all you have to do is reach in there and give it a twist until it's tight again. It's really simple when you know how, but I can't tell you how many times it's happened to me 
it's happened to people I know. They go in, they go, oh my God, we've got a leak. And they're hitting the panic button. It's usually just as simple as that. Before we go into electrical systems, any other questions I need to address? Okay, moving on. Now the electrical system is probably the most complex of the three that we're going to talk about. And the reason is that because you have two systems in your Airstream, you have a 120 volt AC system, which is just like the one in your house. And you have a 12 volt DC system, which runs off the batteries and they power different things in the Airstream. Now, if you bought a new Airstream, you got a copy of this book, The Newbie's Guide to Air Streaming. And in it is a little table which shows you what runs off of what system. For example, all the low power things like fantastic fan, the LED lights, uh, the furnace, um, let's see, water pump, refrigerator, circuit board only, these things all run off the 12 volt system. So when you're boondocking, when you're running without a campground hookup, all of these things still work because they're running off the batteries. High powered things, basically include things like the television, DVD player, air conditioner, and microwave. Those things all pull a fair amount of power, especially the air conditioner and the microwave. So they run off the AC system, and as a result, they only work when you're plugged in, with one exception. Because some Airstreams come with inverters installed, they can run the TV and the DVD player off the batteries if you turn the inverter on. Not every Airstream has an inverter, so you need to check your particular model to see if you have one. If you do have an inverter and you wanna use it to watch TV, that's fine. Just keep in mind when you're running that inverter, it is drawing from the batteries pretty rapidly. And it won't, those batteries won't last uh, as long, nearly as long if you do a lot of that. If you plug in your laptop, for example, that's sucking a fair amount of power through the inverter as well. So be judicious with your inverter use and be sure to turn the inverter off when you're not using it because it draws some power all the time even when you don't have anything running off of it. The inverter itself takes power. Uh, we have a longer blog on our website about inverters. If they confuse you, if the electrical system confuses you, look for a blog that I wrote uh, called Inverters Simplified. And it will help, un help you understand exactly how the inverter works and how these two electrical systems work uh, to help you out in your airstream. Notice in this picture something else. On the left side, we've got the AC system with circuit breakers, just like the circuit breakers in your home. On the right side, we've got fuses, those blue and yellow and green fuses, uh, which are like the fuses in your car. You should know how to reset a circuit breaker, which is very easy. And again, I have a video about that. And you should know how to replace a fuse, which is also very easy. Replacing a fuse basically involves having a little plastic tool like this yellow thing in my hand, as you see in the picture. That's a fuse puller tool. And it's basically a little clamp. And you, if you look at the upper right picture, you can see I'm taking that fuse puller and I'm pushing it over the head of the fuse. It grabs the fuse like a little pair of jaws. And then you pull it out. And lo and behold, the bottom right picture, <clears throat> you can see the fuse came out very easily. It's really hard to get these fuses out without a fuse puller tool. Uh, again, it's one of those things that we throw into the maintenance essentials kit. because It's just one of those dumb little things that you know you never have when you need one. So it's kind of one of those things I recommend people have in their regular kit. I keep the fuse puller tool and an assortment of the fuses by color that we use in a little Ziploc bag and I keep them inside this door. If you're wondering where this door is, it's usually right below the refrigerator. You click for a black panel and you push on the center of it or turn a little knob and the door falls open and there, voila, you will see your fuses and your circuit breakers. And again, we have a video on replacing the, the, uh, the fuses that you can see on our website. Now, the big, the heart of the electrical system is the batteries. Every Airstream has batteries. Most of them come with two batteries uh, and they're either in a box in the front or they're in a little door inside the, inside the trailer, but they're always uh, vented to the outside. Batteries are always, uh, lead acid batteries are always kept on the outside of the Airstream because they, they uh, let off a little bit of hydrogen gas in normal operation and that's explosive. So you wanna have them outside. If you have the standard type of wet cell lead acid batteries, they actually have water in them. It's actually sulfuric acid. And periodically that, that sulfuric acid can evaporate a little bit, or turn to gas in operation, and it needs to have distilled water added to it. So that's a procedure that you can learn. You wanna be very, very careful 
um, splashes of sulfuric acid are not a good thing. So uh, be careful about that. It is discussed in the maintenance book in some detail about that process. Remember, we always use distilled water only, as you can get at the grocery store. Many airstreams, particularly those that came with solar from the factory, came with absorbed glass matte batteries. It's another type of lead acid battery, but it has several big advantages. It has no maintenance. It has no water in it, nothing to fill up. There's nothing you need to do with it at all. It doesn't uh, put out hydrogen gas in normal operation. And as a result, it's safer to put an absorbed glass mat inside the living space. So sometimes when people upgrade the batteries, they want to put in four batteries where they only had room for two. They put the other two under the couch or under the bed. With an AGM battery, that's actually a fairly safe thing to do because they're not going to vent explosive gases in normal operation. The other type of battery that everybody's gaga about is the lithium batteries. Lots of Airstreams are coming with them these days. It's a big upgrade, it's quite expensive. One of the common questions that I'm getting most these days from people is, should I upgrade to lithium batteries? That's a complicated question, which we'll probably have to address in a future blog. So look for that. Um, but I will tell you the big advantages of lithium. Uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries are LiPo batteries. Again, have zero maintenance. They last a long time and they uh, can be drained much more deeply without damage uh, than the other lead acid batteries. Lead acid batteries don't like to be drained below 50%. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, but a LiPo battery, you can drain it all the way down to practically zero and it will not significantly affect the lifespan of that battery. So for example, if you leave the lights on on your car overnight, the battery runs down, you do that two or three times, pretty soon your car won't start because the battery doesn't work anymore. Lithium batteries really don't have that problem, which means you get more useful capacity out of a LiPo battery and they weigh half as much as other batteries. So you get a lot more power for a lot less weight. That's a big advantage in an RV situation. Question. Quick question, um, does it come with an aging battery? What's your car to switch to? Like, to Big question. I, this is the other question I get asked a lot. People who have lead acid batteries, whether they're wet cells or AGM, who want to switch to lithium, they say, what's involved in that? And that is a fairly large question. Um, the short version of it is that not only will you need to replace the batteries, but you will, be, you will need to replace the charge, the charger that's built into the Airstream. Typically that charger is part of that fuse panel. It's, it's, it's all one unit there and you either have to replace the whole thing or sometimes you can just slide out a part of it and replace it. So there's some wiring involved. There's some new hardware involved. You must have a charger that is designed to charge LiPo batteries. Otherwise they won't ever get fully charged and they won't work properly. So that's the big thing there. Um, the other thing is if you have solar, you're going to need to reprogram your, your solar panel uh, controller as well to recognize the LiPo batteries because they, they require much higher voltages than lead acid batteries do. So there's a bit of work there. It's typically, you know, those batteries run about 800 bucks a piece. You buy two of them, you replace the charger, and then you pay for some labor, you're well over two grand. If you do it yourself, you can make people stay under two grand. Yeah, is there? Can you use a trickle charger when you're in storage? Can you use a trickle charger when your Airstream is in storage? Yes, you can. However, if you have a recent Airstream, say I think 2018 or later, you do have a multi-stage charger built into the Airstream. <clears throat> in the past, it was um, sort of lore that the single stage chargers that Airstream used in the old days <clears throat> uh, would overcharge your batteries when left in storage. And as a result, it wasn't recommended that you leave your Airstream plugged in all the time during storage. The newer Airstreams have multi-stage chargers. That is much less of a concern now. So if you have a recently made Airstream with a multi-stage charger built into it, you can just plug your Airstream in. It will be fine. If you have an older Airstream and you think you have a single stage charger, they like said 2017 or 2018, I believe is when they made the transition, uh, then yes, a trickle charger is a perfectly acceptable substitute. So that's, uh, that's a good question. Moving on. No matter what kind of battery you have, you should open up the battery box once in a while. Take a look inside and just see that everything looks more or less what you see in this picture. The connection should be clean, tight, and dry. There should be no evidence of any leakage, certainly no cracks or damage to the batteries themselves. That is fatal. If you see a crack in a battery case, get rid of it. Do not use it anymore, um, but that's pretty rare. Um, the only reason that I've ever seen a battery crack is if it was extremely old, like 20, 30 years old, or 
if the battery had been allowed to freeze solid when it was not charged. A less acid battery that is depleted to zero and then allowed to freeze, and it takes very cold temperatures to do this, like 10 below zero. Um, but if you live in way up in Canada somewhere and you let your battery go dead and it gets extremely, extremely cold, it's possible that the battery case could crack. Uh, those would be reasons to replace the batteries. And finally, check that the hold down bracket, which is right in the center, there's a little twisty thing, just like the one that holds down your propane bottles, make sure that's tight. You don't want those batteries moving when you're in transit. They should be rock solid. So that inspection is very easy, anyone can do it. If you see corrosion on the battery post, that can be cleaned off pretty easily, um, either with um, a mixture of baking soda and water and a little wire brush or just a wire brush, just to, any, any efflorescence, efflorescence is what they call it, uh, like a white powdery substance building up there, that should be cleaned off. Next question. If you don't have access to power in storage, you should either use the battery disconnect switch, which means turn it to off or the store position, and that will disconnect everything from the battery except the solar and the propane leak detector. Uh, so that is an option for you. If you want to have absolutely everything disconnected, then get a wrench out and disconnect the negative cable from the batteries. And that will electrically disconnect the airstream. You don't have to take the positive cable off, just the negative cable. Make sure it's fully removed from the batteries and that would disconnect them and make sure they don't have drain. However, if you're storing your airstream for many months, before you do this, make sure the battery is fully charged. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to check it in about two or three months because batteries do self discharge even when there's nothing attached to them. Lead acid batteries will do that. Again, that's an advantage of LiPo batteries. Their self-discharge rate is extremely low. They'll hold their charge for a long, long time, but a lead acid battery will drop by a certain percentage each month, whether you're using it or not. So even if you disconnect the negative cable, you still need to check on that battery once in a while. The breakers are not connected to the battery. Now the question was, can you pull all the breakers to shut everything off? Remember, the circuit breakers are on the AC side of the system only. They have nothing to do with the 12 volt system at all. What you would have to do is pull every fuse. That's really a hard way to go. So no, I don't recommend that. Um, and, that and it's still probably, I don't know if that would still disconnect the uh, propane leak detector anyway. So no, um, that's not a good strategy. Last battery question. Last battery question. Last battery question. When I'm, when I'm used, I'm plugging 100 <clears throat> Any issues with plugging into No, that's the same question we had before. Is it okay to leave your Airstream plugged into power? And uh, whether it's a 30 amp plug or a household plug makes no difference. Uh, same answer. Okay, enough on batteries. I knew that was going to be a hot topic, though. Always is. One more thing. Oh, I, I do have one more thing on batteries. And this is important because we, uh, when we wrote our battery blog, we found some confusion with people. A 12 volt battery isn't 12 volts. Actually, when it's fully charged, it should be somewhere around 12.7 to 13 volts. So why do they call it a 12 volt battery? Well, I don't know, nominal, okay? So a fully charged lead acid battery, I'm only talking about lead acid, not LiPo right now, is 12.7 to 13 volts, depending on whether or not it's a wet cell or it's an AGM. If it's half full, it's gonna show about 12.2 to 12.3 volts. If it goes below 12 volts, that battery is dead. Well. People don't realize this. They think it's a scale of one to 12 or one is low and 12 is high. No, 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 it's a scale of from 12 to 12.7. That's the operating range of your battery. Below 12 volts means that battery is less than 40 or 50% charged and that will permanently shorten the life of your battery. If it's a lead acid battery, again, a wet cell or an AGM are both lead acid batteries. If you constantly let your battery run below 12 volts, it will not last long. So if you find that you're replacing your batteries every season, this is probably why. And I run into this all the time. Uh, it's one of those things that, you know, those of us who, who do this all the time think, oh, everybody knows that. But no, I, I totally understand where people do not understand this. We had a customer uh, just a couple of weeks ago who called in and said, my solar panels aren't charging my batteries anymore. What's wrong with the solar panels? Well, there was nothing wrong with the solar panels. There was something wrong with the batteries because she'd been boondocking and thought that 11.2 volts was just fine. 11.2 volts is not fine. Even though the lights may still come on, the refrigerator will still work on propane, a couple of things will run, that battery is being tortured. So keep your batteries up. Again, use the battery disconnect when you store, when you're boondocking, 
take a look at that battery meter. It's sometimes it's in the bathroom or in the kitchen area and just check the voltage. If it's running below 12 volts, you really need to charge it up for the health and longevity of your battery. And this is where solar really helps out a lot, much more than having a generator. Solar is going to help you keep your batteries topped up anytime that the sun shines. Uh, and that is a huge advantage. So if you have uh, solar, that's a, a great, great, great help out there. Also on electrical, exposed connections, anything like your power plug, the seven-way plug, uh, the electrical inlet on this trailer itself where the plug connects, all of these connections need to be kept clean. And if they're not kept clean, bad things happen. If you look at the picture, you can see a perfect example. One of those prongs got a little bit corroded from moisture and time. And when the plug is corroded, electrons can't flow through as efficiently as they want to, which means they build up heat. And the heat builds up and the heat causes more corrosion. More corrosion causes more heat, which causes more corrosion. You get the spiraling effect. And one day the plug melts and it can even start a fire. It's a very serious problem. This is an example of one that we caught that was starting to melt. You can see the black melted plastic on the gray plug and strange color that the prong turned kind of coppery color and the damage that was done. Um, it happens on days when you're running the air conditioner a lot. And especially on, you know, it, it may, it, it's not gonna happen all at once. It, might, it takes weeks or even months for this kind of corrosion to build up. Um, but if you don't keep an eye on it, it's gonna get away from you. And then one day, boop, it's gonna be gone and you won't have power, you won't have air conditioning. And it's gonna be on the hottest day of the year because that's the day you're running your air conditioning. So it's a bad situation. And like I said, it can be quite dangerous. So keeping those connections clean is very important. Same thing with the seven-way plug. If you find that when you plug in to your tow vehicle and you're getting all these warnings on the dashboard about tail light out, brake lights out, whatever, brakes not working, and you're like, it's intermittent, what's going on here? It's probably the same problem, corrosion on the prongs. The solution on all of them is exactly the same. And again, I've got a video, how to maintain your electrical connectors uh, on our website, which explains exactly what to do about it. But we do sell a kit, which includes some tools that you need to clean those connections and then cover them with dielectric grease so that they're less likely to corrode in the future. It's a regular piece of maintenance. I recommend you do it at least once a year, if not a couple of times. You should at least inspect the plugs a couple of times a year just to keep an eye on it. It's really an important thing that nobody ever talks about. If we're done with electricity, Going to cover our last topic. Uh, yes. We'll okay. Water okay, we can get to the water questions later. Okay, so let's talk about tires a little bit. Now, I always hesitate to get into the tire topics because everybody likes to debate tires. It's one of the hottest topics out there. I don't know why. Um, but I'm just going to cover some basic non controversial aspects of tires. First of all, the number one thing that you can do to maintain your tires is properly inflate them by far. If you do nothing else, just make sure they have the air in them that they need. It's critical. We'll talk a little bit more about ways to make that easy for you, but you should know the pressure that your tires take. It's printed on the, uh, uh, there's an inspection sticker um, on the side of the Airstream, the lower left outside of the body of mostly model Airstreams, and that includes motorhomes. Uh, which shows the recommended tire pressures. It may also be in the owner's manual that came with your Airstream. If you lost your Airstream owner's manual, we have a blog which shows you where you can go online to get a new owner's manual as a PDF. So check that owner's manual, know the pressure that you're supposed to run. The other thing that you should know about your tire is the date code. You see it circled in red in the picture there. It's a four digit code. Now it's only printed on one side of each tire. So if you don't see it, when you look at the outside of the tire, it's possible you got to crawl underneath and look at the backside with a flashlight to find it. That's just the way it goes, unfortunately. It's going to be this four digit code. This one says 2718. That means this tire was made in the 27th week of 2018. So it's really easy to know the age of your tires. The thing about tires is they're probably not from the same year as your Airstream. Tires, they start to age when they're made, not when they're installed just like the uh, propane leak detector. It's the day that it's, it's, it's built that really matters. So this tire is from 2018. When should you replace it? Lots of reasons that you would replace a tire. 
If you're going to replace it based on age, the industry, industry recommendation is generally about five years. However, that can vary considerably depending on the kind of travel you've done, the damage you've done to the tire, whether it's run underinflated, if it's got any unusual wear, lots and lots of factors there. But at least knowing the age of your tire is a good starting point. Now, I've got another routine piece of inspection maintenance that I do every trip, multiple times on every trip. I call it the one minute roadside inspection. There's a video on our website. Look for it, one minute roadside inspection. The video is literally only about a minute long. And what I talk about is that every time I come to a rest area or a gas station or at the end of my day, I do a quick walk around the Airstream and I look for specific things. I'm looking for tire damage, nails, screws, chunks in the sidewall, unusual wear. I'm making sure that the windows are closed and that the hitch right looks right and nothing's missing and nothing's dragging on the ground. And if you practice this one minute inspection at all of your stops, it becomes second nature. And it literally takes less than a minute once you get good at it. Um, and the more you do it, the more you'll get to know your Airstream so that when something does go wrong, you'll spot it right away. It'll just, it'll pop out at your eye. You'll be like, wait a second, I didn't see that before. I've looked at this a hundred times. So the one minute roadside inspection is probably the best thing you can do for your tires. If something starts to go weird, you're gonna see it. Don't forget that you have a spare tire on any travel trail. The motorhomes don't usually have spare tires. So it's a whole nother story there. But if you have a trailer, you've got a spare underneath the front in a carrier, you should check the pressure on that spare periodically as well. Uh, because without, uh, if, if it doesn't have enough air in it, the day you need it, it won't do you any good unless you travel with a compressor. Uh, one thing that makes the spare a lot easier, because it's a pain to get it out from that carrier. I know you got to get on the ground, you shove it around with your feet. It's heavy, it's dirty. You're going to get filthy doing it. We sell a product called Spare Air, which connects to that and gives you a connection up on the hitch. So instead of having to take the tire out to check its air pressure or to add air to it, You've just got a handy little thing right there where you can reach it. You don't have to get on the ground anymore and you don't have to pull that spare out. It's a real convenience. Uh, I will admit the spare air seems expensive, but it is such a game changer. So I really recommend that. Now back to where I was talking about replacing tires. I said, you're gonna replace your tires based on their age, five years or so. Some tires go longer. I went six and a half on a set one time. Where? whether or not they're starting to wear down or abuse. If you've ever run your tire for a significant amount of time, or really, I say any amount of time, more than 10% underinflated, that's considered abuse, and that tire's life is shortened. So um, if it's had some bad episodes, you're not, well, I'll put some air in it, and it seems okay now, it may not really be okay. That might be a sign that you need to change that uh, tire out. Look at the picture here. You'll see something interesting. Notice how the wear on most of the tread looks pretty good, but right in that spot in the foreground, there's a bald spot. That's the kind of thing you're looking for in your one minute roadside inspection. Why would there be a bald spot right there? In the case of this particular tire, it had what's called a belt separation. It actually failed internally. And so that spot started to bulge and it wore out very quickly. And maybe of course in two or 300 miles, that wear spot developed. I spotted it when I was doing my roadside inspection and I got a new tire. So that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. And don't forget when you replace your tires, always replace the stems. Most tire shops are gonna do it automatically anyway, but that's definitely something you wanna do. I also recommend carrying a tire changing kit if you have a travel trailer. And again, if you have a motor home, you have an interstate or an Atlas, it may come with tire changing tools. Some do, some don't from Mercedes, which are designed specifically for that vehicle. However, since you don't usually have a spare tire, those tires, those tools aren't doing you a whole lot of good anyway. So right now I'm talking about travel trailers, which have spare tires, but don't come with tire changing tools. We sell a kit, and this is one of our most popular kits, the tire changing kit. It's a padded bag that contains all the things in there. If you're going to put together your own tire changing kit, that's fine. I don't care if you don't buy it from us, it's okay. But make sure you have a good quality torque wrench because you need to tighten the lug nuts to a specific torque, 110 foot pounds, when you put them back on and you need to check that torque periodically every time you change a tire. We have full instructions in the maintenance book and in the kit. If you buy the kit, the instructions are in there to explain to you exactly how to torque uh, the lug nuts. I also have a video of how to use a torque wrench, which you can check out. Uh, you need a torque wrench, you need a breaker bar, you need a couple of, you need the right size socket. And sometimes it has to be a special thin wall socket. You need uh, some kind of safety vest I would recommend or flares or something, and you should have a tire cage. All of these things should be in your tire kit and they should be in your Airstream 
every trip. Just throw it in one of the compartments and never take it out because you never know when you're going to need it. A question. Should you rotate your trailer tires? That's a good question. Um, it is optional, um, but not a bad idea. If you're noticing in your routine inspections of your tires that perhaps the front tires are wearing a little bit more than the rear tires on a tandem axle trailer, um, then that would be an indicator that it might be a good idea to rotate the tires front to back on both sides. Um, not a bad idea. However, my experience has been that trailer tires tend to wear out or age out um, before they really would benefit from rotation. Your mileage may vary. So I'm not gonna give a hard and fast recommendation that you should or should not rotate your tires, but uh, it certainly can't hurt. Anything? Okay. Okay, TPMS. Um, one of my really big recommendations, use a tire pressure monitoring system. Now we have people come through here all the time in the store and they look at the cost of a tire pressure monitoring system, depending on how many tires you have, it can run anywhere from 250 to $500 or so. Most people for four tires, it's $386. They go, I don't, ooh, it's a lot of money to spend. Do I really need this? Do I really need this? That's the question they ask. And the answer I give them is, yes, you do. And I'm not just trying to sell it. I'm telling you, as somebody who's had some flats and who's been saved by our TPMS multiple times, you need it. Because if a tire goes flat on an Airstream trailer, you're not going to know until it's far too late. You can't feel it from the driver's seat. You will see the chunks of tire flying away when it's already done its damage. When a tire goes flat on an Airstream, it initially doesn't do any harm most of the time. But if it's allowed to run flat, eventually it's going to shred into a million pieces, and those pieces are going to rip chunks off your airstream. They're going to bend the aluminum on the side. Now you're looking at an extremely expensive bodywork job, which can be thousands of dollars, definitely going to be thousands of dollars, depending on how extensive the damage is. So I regard the $386 cost of a TPMS as cheap insurance, and it has already saved me numerous times. I love it when people come in the store and they say, oh, I've got that. Oh, yeah, that saved us last month. So I really recommend it. Now, if you're shopping for a tire pressure monitoring system, I'm gonna tell you, there's a lot of them out there. Don't buy a cheap one. The cheap ones are not reliable in my opinion. I don't like them. We only use and we only recommend TST brand. It's the only one that we've seen that has real reliability. You might be tempted by one that's got a cool Bluetooth app or something like that. But, and the reality is that uh, you want a reliable one, not a fancy one. The TST system is awesome. We've got a couple questions here about Valve yes. There seems to be confusion around using a TPMS. They said you had to get steel valve stems. Right. I get this a lot. Yeah, the steel valve stem thing is sort of a myth. Um, you for the um, for travel trailers, the sensor that goes on uh, the TST sensor is so light that you do not need to change the stems. You do not need steel stems. If you want to have steel stems, that's fine. No harm done, but that is not required. It will not do any damage with the standard high pressure stems that come with your Airstream. If you have a motorhome and you're using flow through sensors, which is a different kind of sensor that allows you to check the air and leave the sensor in place. In that case, steel stems are recommended, but that's strictly a flow through sensor on a motorhome situation. For the vast majority of our customers with travel trailers, there is no need to change the stems. Yep. Somebody says I purchased TST from last year Okay, we just had a customer <laughs> comment. <laughs> Somebody said they had a valve stem go bad on them. They bought a TPMS from us and it just saved their bacon. So see, this is the kind of thing I get all the time. I'm telling you, a TPMS is really a good idea. Uh, by the way, we have a video there demystifying tire pressure monitoring. If you want to learn more about it, go watch that video. So finally, a few general tips and then we'll have a little bit of time for questions. I think we're going to run over, but that's, that's okay. If it's okay with me if it's okay with you guys. Um, there's lots of things in your Airstream that don't last forever. Things like batteries and the smoke detectors. And I talked about the propane leak detector. We've got a video called Nine Things That Expire in Your Airstream. I strongly recommend you watch it. Uh, it talks about things that you might not have thought about that you should probably uh, replace annually or every few years, depending on what it is. So Nine Things That Expire in Your Airstream, great video to watch. We also have another video about lubrication. We get a lot of questions about what needs lube in your Airstream. So we did this one called Stop the Squeak. Nine places your Airstream wants lube. And we talk about lubricating things like the zip the awning, the hinges, uh, the window actuators, the hitch, the stabilizer jacks, uh, lots and lots of things around there. But we don't just talk about what needs lube. We talk about the kinds of lube that you should carry with you 
and how they're all properly applied. So it's a, a great video to watch. I say that even though it's me in it, you know, I don't know, I got to my own horn here, um, but uh, I really think that's a good one. It's just a, like a three or four minute video. And finally, this video, which seems to help people a lot about the secret access points inside your Airstream. There's lots of them, little hatches that you didn't know existed, places where it makes it so much easier for you to get to diagnose a potential plumbing leak or check to see if rodents have chewed on the wires or to find that wedding ring that fell down behind the counter. Lots of reasons that you should know all the secret access points in your Airstream, save you a lot of trouble. For example, for example maybe your, uh, your shower drain clogs up and you can't get to the P-trap. There might be a secret access point that makes that really easy. So watch that video, secret, six secret access points for troubleshooting and repair. That's it for my prepared slides. I'm gonna to go to the rest of the questions that we've got from Tothi. So, TST. TST. Sometimes you find that it loses the connection while you're driving. Ah, this, is important. this is an important one. The question was, do we find that sometimes the TST loses its connection while we're driving? And the answer is that it will never do that if you use the repeater. Every TST kit we sell comes with a repeater. The repeater looks optional, but it's not. You need to wire it in. It's very simple to wire it in. It just connects to the battery terminals and it's got some self-stick tape. You can just stick it right there on the battery box and it'll be fine, it's weatherproof. The repeater is required if you want the warranty to be effective on your TST. And that's because these days, driving down the road, every vehicle that you pass has got a radio in it, sometimes three or four. You got cellular things, you got car tracking things, you got you know, radios for other people's tire pressure monitors, all this radio frequency interference, it's everywhere. And then you've got towers all by the roads and things like that. If you don't use the repeater, it is possible that the signal could be dropped. And you don't want that. You want 100% reliability from a tire pressure monitoring system. So TST, that's why they only honor the warranty if you install the repeater. They wanna know that you've got 100% reliability. If you're having problems with dropouts, wire in the repeater. 90% of the time, that's the problem. The other 10% of the time is dead batteries in the sensors. So if they're getting wonky on you, the batteries only last about 18 months to two years. We sell a battery replacement kit where you can buy the batteries yourself. Uh, they're pretty common button cell batteries. You should replace those batteries uh, at least every two years. Next one. The question is, is the TPMS necessary on an Interstate 24X coach? I think a TPMS is essential on any vehicle that does not have a TPMS from the factory. I am not 100% sure whether or not the Interstate 24X, which is based on the Mercedes-Benz, has a built-in TPMS. If it does, you're good. If it does not, I would get one. Next question. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Back to electricity and batteries. A lot more questions. A lot more questions on batteries. Okay, yeah. let's go. Do you have a heater change before you go to the winter? Is there no water in the heater? The water heater should be turned off. Is that why? And does it matter if it's lead battery or lithium? Whoa. Battery? Okay. Wait. 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 Well, let's do the so first part of that one. <laughs> okay. If your airstream, let me see if I understand the question correctly. If your airstream is stored for the winter and there's no water in the water heater, of course your water heater should be off. Why would you have it on? <laughs> you wouldn't want to heat an empty water heater. That would probably cause something bad to happen. And besides, why would you run your water heater when your airstream's in storage? So of course the water heater should be off. So regardless of the type of battery. The water heater would always be off. Well, of course your battery disconnect should be in the disconnect position. So the water heater wouldn't run anyway, because if it doesn't have 12 volt power, it's not going to turn on. So. Can you overcharge the battery? Okay. It is possible to overcharge a battery, but not with the power converters that come with your Airstream. You'd have to do it some other way. Like I said, the multi-stage chargers that come in all late model Airstreams will not overcharge your batteries. They're designed to cut off at a certain point. So no, you can leave it plugged in and you're fine. Anything else? Uh, how about someone with water? Oh, water. So there seems to be a little confusion. We talked about the, the drain plug needing to be replaced. Yes. We had somebody say that we need, he replaces his with Teflon tape. Yeah. And he has no problem. What's your opinion on that? Okay, if you're replacing that nylon drain plug, and again, this is only the tank type water heater. So if you have a tankless one, you can go get a cup of coffee because this isn't relevant to you. But if you have a tank type water heater and it has that nylon drain plug in it, sometimes you do need some Teflon tape around the threads to keep it from leaking. That is normal. Um, however, I still don't recommend reusing the plug even if you do use Teflon tape. You might get away with it for a little while, but eventually, like I said, it's going to break. And Ask me how I know, because I've been stupid 
many, many, many times, all the things I'm telling you here are from painful experience. And one of them was reusing the drain plug and then having to pick the pieces out with a pair of needle nose pliers for an hour because it got stuck in, the, in there and broke into a bunch of pieces. That's how I know that you need a TPMS. That's how I know you need a tire changing kit. That's how I know you need to be able to check for propane leaks with a soapy water bottle. I carry all these things because all of these things have happened to me sometimes more than once. Next question. You talked about the water contaminating the water pressure regulator. Yes. Yes. If somebody was asking about if they would ever need an exterior one, when would they need it? You, where would you go? Where would they it, go? The only reason, like I said, that you would ever need a water pressure regulator on an Airstream would be, well, two reasons. If somebody was a vintage Airstream and somebody had taken the pressure regulator out, that's possible. But the more likely circumstance is that you have a cheap water hose and the water hose can't take the pressure from the campground and might burst. Um, then you might use a regulator to protect the hose. But honestly, if you've got a $30 white hose, and then you're going to go buy a pressure regulator for another 20 or $30. Why would you do that to protect a cheap hose when for, you know, a little bit more money, you could buy a good hose that's going to last you forever and is never going to need a regulator. My, my recommendation is invest in good gear and you won't need a regulator. And how much pressure can that thing take? This blue hose, or we have it in white also, can take 375 PSI. You will never see campground pressure that high. That's fire hydrant high kind of pressure. That's crazy. Um, high pressure in a campground is like 80 PSI. So this hose will not burst under any campground water pressure that you connect it to. We absolutely guarantee it. We have a five-year guarantee on this hose. If it fails for any reason, other than you cutting it open with a knife, if you freeze it, you run over it with your truck, you connect it to high pressure, your dog chews on it. We don't care. We guarantee it. We have never had to replace a failed hose. We've had a couple come back where people said it leaked, but it didn't, they were just confused, but they don't fail. So that's what you're paying for. It's a good quality hose. It's gonna last you for many years. Back to tires, <clears throat> how high is too high for the TPMS monitor? 80 PSI for my tires is 92. Oh, if you're setting your TPMS yourself, the recommendation is to set the high pressure warning at 25% above whatever pressure you run and to set the low pressure warning at 10% below. So for example, if your tires run at 80 PSI, which is pretty common for Airstream trailers, your low pressure would be set at 72 and your high pressure would be set at 100. Next question. Do the AGM batteries get charged through the seven-way plug? Do, well, the question was, do the AGM batteries get charged through the seven-way plug when you're connected to your tow vehicle? And of course, that applies to all batteries, not just AGMs. The answer is yes, they do, but very, very slowly. It's not a great way to charge batteries. It would take many, many hours, if not days, to charge a discharge battery that way because most cars don't really put that much power out through that plug. They're not intended to be used as big time chargers. They're just intended to maybe be able to activate the brakes. So you're talking about a very low current flow. So yes, they do get a charge. No, it's not very much. This is a good one. If you change the batteries in your TPMS, do you have to reprogram the sensors? If you change the batteries in your TPMS sensors, do you have to reprogram the system? And the answer is no, you don't. The system doesn't forget. So even though you take the batteries out of the sensors and put new batteries in, it will still remember, no problem. Can you clarify this? I think it's confusing. <clears throat> what if the PSI goes over? If the pressure on your TPMS goes above or below the range that we set, remember I said low was 72, high was 100 in my example. If it goes above or below those ranges, it's going to alarm very loudly. Beep, 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 beep. It's going to flash. It's going to show you the pressure. And if it's a fast leak, it's going to say fast leak. And it really kind of raises a ruckus to get you to pull over right away and take care of that problem. So yes, it's a quite loud visual alarm uh, that you will pay attention to, believe me. Okay. Do you have any questions on the electrical fixture? No. Sure, if we don't have anything else. Maybe. We're, we're just in terms of what do we need to maintain that thing? Blue, okay, you know, this is off topic. So we're gonna do one. Okay, we have three people ask about this, so I'll answer this. The question was, what do you need to do or is there any maintenance for the power hitch jack? Um, usually the maintenance is zero to minimal. Um, on some hitch jacks, it is recommended that you put a very small quantity of lithium grease at a particular point. When you got your new Airstream, you probably got, a, in the owner's manual packet, there was a separate guide for that power hitch jack. But because there's many different types used, I can't tell you exactly for your model, 
but it is possible that you might need a little bit of white lithium grease on the gears once in a while. However, for most of them, there's no maintenance required. So, hmm? so there's the, I think that's not okay. As a reminder, the foot count on the torque ratio is 120 foot pounds. For trailers, um, all the recent trailers made, uh, the torque for the uh, lug nuts is 110 foot pounds. The correct number for your trailer will always be in the owner's manual. I recommend you take a look and find out what it is. Uh, we talk about that in the newbies guide as well. Um, typically it's 110 foot pounds. If you have an aluminum wheel, it's 110 foot pounds. If you have a steel wheel, it might be higher or lower. Well, we're gonna wrap up. Uh, I know there's more questions. Uh, we can never get to them all, but I wanna say thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate you folks and we appreciate all the support and the questions and the ideas that you give us. And we love it when you drive down I-10 through Tucson and drop in and visit us. We've had a lot of visitors this winter. It's really been great. Uh, we'll do another webinar as soon as we can get around to it, might be a few months. Uh, but in the meantime, we always invite you to chat, email with us, and, uh, and just uh, and stay in touch. And uh, uh, read our blogs. If you're not subscribed to our emails, you should definitely do that so you get notified when new videos and new blogs come up. Subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. So we've got lots of ways to continue to educate you and help you out. And we hope you uh, got a lot out of this. And we'll see you next time or on the road. Thanks for coming.